Hello and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for May 10th, 2019. I'm your host, Lincoln Damerst, and I'm here with Steph Hodge and W. Eric Martin. How are you guys doing? Hi, doing well. How are you? Lovely. You're doing lovely. Well, <laughs> I'm doing great. Been super busy. Uh, Scott Alden's not here today because he has been busy all night long working on the Origins preview and pre-order system that we have starting today, I believe. And, yeah, possibly uh, starting today. Yes, and it's will already be going by the time you guys see the episode, hopefully. Uh, yes. The neatest thing about it is we are allowing the users to pre-order from publishers for Origins uh, Pickup. Want to tell us a little bit about that, Eric? Yes, this is a system I've uh, been asking about for a while, and of course, I'm not a tech guy. I can ask for all types of things that I don't know whether it's possible <laughs> to do. Um, so finally, we we're, we're figured out how to make this happen, where we're integrating within the convention pre-order system a pre-order system that publishers can sign up and opt to use. They don't have to do it if they don't want to, but any publisher who's interested, who has items listed on the Origins 2019 preview, and then subsequently the Gen Con preview, the Spiel preview, and so on, they can sign up to take pre-orders for items listed on that convention preview for pickup at the convention. So publishers Super can exciting. better gauge their inventory. They have to handle less cash at shows if they take pre-orders ahead of time. And we'll see what else we can work out with this system. I like to have a way that publishers could list more than just what, what is new. Uh, I talked with a couple of publishers that said it would be great for clearance items. Stuff and where, plus just catalog items, right? Yeah, where they don't necessarily know that they should bring this or, oh, we've got 20 people who actually want this game that we otherwise would not have brought. So if you can sell them in advance, people get exactly what they want it works out better for everybody. As a buyer, the clearance item sounds awesome. <laughs> Get the good deals? No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something publishers always struggle with because, of course, they, they often end up spending lots of money on storage for something where they just want to get rid of it. And so this might give them an option to clear things out more easily. Absolutely. Or, yeah. Where, again, they only have to bring what they know they can sell. Yeah, it's so, definitely so a book. Well, I mean, obviously they'll be, bring more than that because they're gonna. There's many people that attend that won't be on the uh, convention preview, but it's definitely a fantastic tool, and more and more people will know about it. And the opportunity to pre-order is fantastic. And it's all in one space. So you'll have already paid for it, and you just so go good. pick it up. Yeah, and Origins is the test run. It's much smaller than Gen Con and Spiel, so we want to make sure we work all the bugs out, which is why we're delayed a little in launching the preview. Uh, from its original May 6th start date. Scott wrote me last night. It's like, I'm not sure I'm going to make the recording. And I go, well, obviously the preview is important, so don't worry about it. That's right. <laughs> Everything's been pushing. There's lots of development and tools and all these. I see little snippets of tech stuff, and I'm just like, I have no clue. I Just just tell me when it's working. I, I can do nothing. Agreed. Well, this. I know you've been wanting it for a long time. It's always been on the top of your list. And thankfully, once we got Chaz Marler programming with us, we were able to make that happen. Yeah, Chaz did a great intro video as well that I was able to share with publishers. So it gave them a firsthand look at how to use the system from their perspective. We talked about doing one as well from the user perspective, someone who's interested in knowing what the process is for buying games on the system. So we hope to have that as well. In two short weeks time, we'll all be at BGG Con Spring, yes. uh, for, including Scott Allen, who uh, is obviously busy today. Um, I'm super excited. We're gonna have the SDJ jury there showing us the newly nominated games. Uh, I'm sure that ticket sales are all closed off now. So if you can't, if you didn't get in, unfortunately you're not gonna make it. If you are attending, come and say hello. We'd love to say hi to you. Yeah, come say hi. And I, now we're going to move to the uh, Scott's favorite segment and everybody else's favorite segment. What have you been playing? And I would start with you, Steph, but oh my gosh, I see what's er on Eric's list. And I wanted <laughs> I to know. start with it because I just got my own copy of the game and I cannot <gasps> wait to play it. What have you been playing, Eric? Yes. I have played Die Tavernen im Tiefental, which is the Taverns of the Deep Valley. And we talk about Spielosaurus nominated games. I can see this game getting a Kennerspiel nomination, similar to how Wolfgang Varsch's Die Quacksauber von Quedlinburg had received a nomination and then won for Kennerspiel in 2018. The games aren't similar in how they're played, but they're sort of similar in complexity and in options available to players. And so it feels like it's hitting the same target market 
with the same designer, same publisher, same type of publication, same look with uh, Dennis Lohausen doing the art again. Similar weight. <laughs> yeah, similar weight. Yeah. And what's funny is it has a similar complication to learning the game. So both Quacksauber and Tavernin have lots of rules presented to you up front. And I read the rules for Tavernin twice, just the rules on their own without the game being open. And I was completely baffled as to what I should do and how you play and how the, the game flows and nothing made any sense. It was not coming together at all. Just reading the rules. I used to be pretty good. I thought it sort of putting <laughs> together the game in my mind. But then you put everything out on the table, you punch it out, you put aside all the items for the four sort of expansion modules in the game and just go with the base game and those base components in front of you. And it makes a lot more sense. Uh -huh. So yeah. And then the second game, you're just flow immediately. Everything's nice. yeah. completely clear. So it's just that, it's that one hurdle to get over at the beginning. But of course, it all comes together. <laughs> everyone has to clear that hurdle. <laughs> I don't know if someone's learning the game from that rule book. It's 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 a little obtuse at first. You're just like I don't I don't know what's going on here. I've been hearing that everybody is dying to play the game immediately after playing it. So maybe that's part of that uh, desire. You're like I've got it now. Let's go. Yes, it it does have that feel because the game is a deck builder, but it's not like a traditional deck builder along the lines of Dominion or Ascension or something like that. Every player has their own tavern. You start with some things in your tavern, you know, some tables, you, possibly, you have space for a safe and a beer vault and things like that. And you have a deck that contains seven guests, a waitress, an extra table, and a beer supplier, because you're all serving beer at your taverns. And each round, you reveal cards from your deck until all your tables are filled. With customers. With customers, yes. Paying customers. Ideally, they you will actually be serving them. They are there to buy, but whether you deliver beer or not, well, you'll see. Yeah. So everyone fills up their table. You then roll four dice and you draft dice. So choose one, pass it, choose one until you each have four. You might have some of your own dice as well because the waitresses, if you have waitresses, they bring your own dice. Oh, that's very convenient. After you draft all the dice, you place them onto your tavern and then you carry out the actions. So different numbers are good for guest or for beer supply. Uh, there's some random ones to earn coins other ways, or you have a monk there who can lead you around the monastery for special bonuses. And initially you don't have that many choices, but as you earn money, you can add new guests to your deck or additional table or a dishwasher or some guy just bring, bringing in some beer, some other things. And you can also upgrade parts of your tavern where they're all two sided. So you flip over and now I have a built in dishwasher or I hired <laughs> I hired someone now. He's permanently there where the dishwasher <laughs> lets you add one to a die, you know, as you place it in there. It's very costly, but it's worth it. Yeah, you can that dishwasher add another is important. table. It is. You need some <laughs> manipulation of the dice there. And you get nobles. Or add additional dice, ex room for extra money storage, because you can only store up to two money or two beer from round to round. So if you want to store more, you need to upgrade those areas. Most importantly, though, each time you upgrade an area, you add a noble to your deck. And the nobles sort yeah. of function like provinces. They're worth 10 points, but they are also a guest. So you can actually serve them beer and earn money. They're not just useless when you draw them like a province. You can actually earn money from them at the same time. But they're also kind of cheap. They don't like to spend lots of money. They don't. <laughs> that's how they stay rich, of course. Yeah, that's that how, is they how the wealthy rich. stay wealthy. <laughs> so you go through eight rounds. You have a different bonus each round, uh, or adding things to your deck, and you sort of escalate as the rounds go. It all starts simple, but then you get more and more in your deck. You have the ability to flush your tavern sometimes, like clear the room, you pull a fire alarm and everyone has to leave. And then you start drawing from your deck again if you don't like what came up the first time. So That's cool. you got some ways to modify the luck there and take care of things. And then you escalate over the course of the game. And then you see who has the most points, which are only going to be in your deck. Every Everything that has points adds to your deck. And so you have to keep that in mind while you're playing. 
Yeah, when I got to play, I had a killer turn. I think I got like six or seven nobles in one round, and they all go right to the top of your deck. And all the nobles like to sit at the same table, so they all can just stack on each other. That's right. Um, they don't fill up the tables with a hoi polloi. No. no. <laughs> yeah, they, they just all... like they like to they like to sit together. So I had yeah. one really good turn at the end because all of my waitresses came out and all my beer delivery guys came out and I had just like everything I could ever want. <laughs> yeah. Round, so. And knowing what's in your deck and what has not come out yet lets you plan ahead for those rounds. So I'd play the game with like this. Oh, there's still there's two beer suppliers in like the next five cards or something. So let me do something this round to then plan for next round. And the most important thing as well that helps you do this is that every card you buy or acquire goes on top of your deck and then is available next round. So awesome. it's not randomized where you put it in your discard pile and you don't see it for a little while. You know what's coming. And so you can plan ahead to prepare for that. I've got one beer supplier, I'll buy a second one. And now I'm gonna get lots of money for all the beer that I have. Or, sorry, I'm going to have lots of beer from all the beer supplier coming in. And with beer, you then get to uh, attract guests. So, yeah. Or nobles. There's there's an end game thing, too, where it doesn't have to be end game. But if you just have nine beer, you get a noble. But also, like, the more, like, beer suppliers you have, you can use those cards to actually upgrade your beer supplier on your board. So, like, yes. I, got, I could upgrade, like, three different things at one turn to collect those three nobles and then also buy some with the beer that I was collecting as well. So it's like all these different things and the ordered operations you, you do them is, is really cool. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a hill to climb at first, but then you flow after that. Neat. Well, it looks like both Eric and Steph jumped in on the deep dive to in place of Scott today. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's somebody really has good. To, you got to try it. If you somebody it, you has to do it. it. I'm excited about it. I definitely want to try it. Steph, what have you been playing? Oh, gosh. I have been playing Roll for the Galaxy Rivalry. Um, so it's been... I, I love Roll for the Galaxy, but it's been a while since I've played it. And, you know, I've played the Ambition, um, the second, the first expansion. So adding this new expansion was... was it has multiple modules, and it's there's a lot in this box. I only played one of the modules so far. Yeah, it's um, a big, big expan. It's several expansions in one big box. It's, Expensive it, box. <laughs> it is, but it's worth it because it has a lot of customizable dice, which Tom Lehman is like all about these customizable dice right now, and it's awesome. And so basically, in the expansion uh, module that I played, we. Um, had these called the orb dice. So basically you get this customizable die that you roll each turn and it will get you some bonus in your round for you only, generally you only. Some some of the upgrades might allow you to help other people, like have an automatic ship no matter what. Like it's an extra ship action that everybody can take. Um, but I was focused mostly on um, developing. So I had a lot of my sides would give me minus one to developing or minus two to developing. Like, so I just had like, oh, so much development. I think I had like 40 points of development because the game is actually longer because you're playing over more victory points and more tiles out to 15 tiles now than instead of 12. So it does go a little bit longer. That's right. Well, more time to develop your strategy. <laughs> You're yeah, customizing which is actually everything. really nice. Um, and so there's different ways you can customize your dice. You can go to level one of the development strategy and then level two and three. So you can upgrade these dice. And the more you upgrade the different paths you go, the, the more points you get from upgrading those. So each level two, you get a point. Level four, you get two points kind of thing. So you're trying to upgrade your dice. And it adds this whole other action. Instead of your normal five actions, you can have a six action, which is research, in order for you to upgrade that die. So the the player sheet is like this big. Like it's so big because there's so many different With the ways options you can available. upgrade. Yeah. yeah, for upgrading. And so I didn't even get to look at another module, which is deals. I, I think it's basically negotiation with other players and upgrading these dice that are common pool. I, I can't wait to look into that because it just looks like so much more if the game could even have that much more, but it clearly there's a lot to it. And it comes with all these little tokens and oh it's just <laughs> it's a lot of game, huh? It's, I gotta get a play no case for all these bits. Oh wow. <laughs> I know, there's just so much. 
Well, fortunately, I played a, a game full of game too. I play. I finally got a chance to play Imaginarium from oh, Bombix Games. Oh, it looks so good. From uh, it's designed by Bruno Catala and Florian Sire, I believe. Sire X. It is a neat, neat game. It's a it's an interesting engine builder with this very limited area for you to add your cards to actually start doing things. The good thing is, you know, it's four spaces. There is one roll, I believe, or one bonus. Uh, it's not a bonus. What are they? It's an upgrade, essentially, that you can purchase that allows you to have a little bit more area to grow. But the neat thing is, is you will add these cards that will create goods for you to purchase other cards, of course. And it... Uh, the, but what you can do is you can sell off cards for points. And it actually plays... It's 20 points... Uh, first to 20 points ends the game, but it's not necessarily the winner. And you do, uh, you, you'll tally all your stuff at the end. But what's going on is you really get this engine going and it kind of gets going really quickly, potentially. And then it kind of struggles. Like you're looking, where can I get points here and there? Because all the goals are nece- are filled up. There's, um, so, so there are communal goals that everybody can score once you've complete, you've reached that target. And, there's uh, five different ones, I believe, active in the game. Um, and if the first person that gets it will get the full value of the, the card, everybody else afterwards will get the value of the card minus one. So it's a little difficult to quite get to that 20 points, but it's really, really quite neat. And a beautiful, beautiful sculpted minis. Of course, fantastic art as usual with the French Productions. Um, really, really great. Have you had a chance to play it, Eric? <laughs> I have not. I know we recorded, I think, three video overviews. I know it's over the been in the works for a while. Kept seeing it, you know, in prototype form, and then a little more advanced, a little more advanced, and it's just sort of the the French nature of showing games in advance. You know, far well, and I I know it's a, available. it's available in Europe and it's in English because we played an English copy of the game. But I believe Nikki works for Surf and Meeple, and they're doing the game, so. Uh, we it's finally coming out in the states sometime soon oh yeah. hopefully it's gorgeous it's taken a while to get to distribution which has happened with a few companies like that where the games are out in europe and then maybe they come to the u.s it's just i don't believe publishers take everything so the distributor in the united states uh would have probably been asmodee for bombix but in this case i guess asmodee did not want to do it um I'm not, believe me, that's all me talking out of my hat because I really don't know. But uh, we've been excited to try the game for a long time and I don't know for sure even when it's coming. It's supposed to be this year at some point and we got, fortunately got to play it at um, Kubla Now, which is these new mini conventions that KublaCon's doing. I was there two weeks ago and it was fantastic actually for being there. I only got to do one day because I was very busy the second day. But uh Really, really cool little convention. They had a giant War, uh, Warhammer 40K tournament going on. Uh, but they had the, the giant uh, uh, Captain Sonar that they did at Cannes. So they had one uh, at the event for this one. And they're going to have it at Kubla Khan, uh in May. Same time we're at BGG Con Springs. So, uh, but it's a very cool game. There's really there's a, there's some take that cards, of course, because it is a French game. Um but they're kind of difficult to do because they're one shots. It's you have to buy it. It potentially, if you're paying attention, because you, your resources are behind a screen. If you're right. paying attention, you could time that card to fire and then steal all the goods from the other players. Oh um, wow! Yeah, it's cruel, man. That's a that's a that but, is pretty cruel. But we couldn't fit. We didn't actually end up doing that because I I think I purchased a protection card. Um, and I don't even remember exactly why. Oh, I know. I had like a, one of the goals that you could go for would be to build two of those. It was very difficult to get the one built. So I started just focusing on getting the goods that I needed. And if as the, the goal, the, the five common goals that you can get that give you a good amount of points. They're like from probably three to five points or something like that. Um, they're really kind of neat and challenging. One of the ones was they have... I can't remember what the coleum or something like that is coal that you're producing. And you need to have 15, I believe, in at the end, uh, at some point, you know, at the end of your turn. And I had 14 so many times. I just couldn't get it over that <laughs> oh, no. hump. Took a while to finally get it. I was still the first to make it. And then Rusty was right behind me because he had, uh, both of us were like very, very close. But you always end up spending more than you think. And then you didn't quite have it. But it's really, really clever game. Uh, 
And I, I would like to actually try it with some of the take that elements just to see how that all works. It just didn't end up working out for us because everybody. the reality is the engine cards that you're buying are way more compelling ultimately, right? If you can get it, if you can get it to work because you can stack them and what they have, what they do is when you, let's say, produce the coal or there's gems and wood, uh, goodness, I don't remember the good. I think there's three goods plus the coal. Um, the coal's like the money, but you need the gems to do, uh, the other goods to do stuff to buy those uh, cards as well. Because so, what you do is you buy the card from the array, then you must repair it. So it's this, uh, and the repair is the cost of the wood and the uh, the gems. And goodness, what's the third good? I don't remember. Um, but so it's a, it's a multi-stage thing. So you put the card to the side, then you have the four slots. And for example, if you built the coal card, the initial uh, production is three. If you can stack a second one, it's seven, I believe. And then if you can get, put a third one on, it's 10 or 12. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of goods. If you can do that, but it's, you gotta get it in place, then you gotta put in your array, then you have to play reorganization. And the way That's you do, yeah. it's, it's, and it's tough, especially with four slots. And the way you do it is you select two actions on your wheel. And it's a V that you cannot split. So you'll pair it up with things. And you could ping pong back and forth. Let's say you wanted to do re uh, repairs. You could do something that pairs it with repair and something else. Or the other way, pair, uh, pair it with repairs and something else on the other side. But you can't do the same V positions uh, in a, uh, two turns in a row. So it's that balance is really, really awesome. I really, really appreciate the game. Initially, I was like, again, it's like massively beautifully produced French production, much like uh, the Victorian masterminds we did recently on Game Night, but it's so nice. The mean game kind of reminded me of like the Monopoly card in Catan, like, give me all your weed. Like, it is exactly that kind of thing. There's <laughs> there's some other cards, too. Again, that's the one I remember that I was kind of like think preparing a get to fight against with my green card. Then I ended up just... Ca the green card was a defense card. I ended up just cashing it out for victory point because I, I needed the space. Uh, Eric, have we got any good news stuff coming up here? <laughs> uh, some news that has happened. It's sort of the slow period, April, May. Everyone preparing for conventions. Along those lines, the Origins Game Fair has announced the nominees for the Origins Awards for 2019. I'm not going to list all the dozens of candidates here. Um, but they have strategy games, family games, card games, miniature games, and then also role-playing games, game accessories, tons of stuff in there. And it seems like a pretty decent mix of nominees. The nominees kind of fall in the same category as the Mental Mind games, where publishers have to submit their games in order to be considered. So, of course, if not that many publishers submit, well, then you're going to get a less representative... Uh, nature in the nominees, I guess I should say. Some things where you're like, huh, why is that there? I don't know if I consider that best. Well, maybe they were just one of the people who stepped up and submitted. I don't know. I don't know what the, <laughs> I don't know what happens all behind the scenes there, but I know it's, it's the manufacturer submit things. Uh, the, there's committee members who are members of the origins committee will determine nominees. And then it sort of goes on and there'll be a jury uh, decision with the award with the award winners being announced during the Origins Game Fair. And there will also be a fan favorite prize. So if you are attending, you can vote in each of the categories for whatever you like best. Sort of along the same lines, the Deutscher Spiele Prize, the German uh, award that's not the Spiel des Jahres, but it's sort of <laughs> the second most famous German game award. That's announced at Essen, correct? That is announced at Essen, yes. The, the winners... Uh, for the adult game and then there's a children's game as well and it is all determined by user votes so if you go to the website for the dsp website uh, you can vote for your five favorite games released in the second half of 2018 or first half of 2019 you determine whether it falls in that category or not they don't give you a list it just name five games and then name wow. a children's game and that's it and huh. so it's well it's, you know it's up to you, if, if you like something enough, maybe that came out in July, well, then if enough other people also vote for that, it'll end up in the list because they have the winner, but they usually announce a top 10. Oh, OK. DSP. Yeah. So it's not just one game gets recognized. It's top 10 vote getters. So, 
you know, you can you can vote for something obscure or you can be more calculating and be like, well, this was an out released during Spiel, so it'll have got lots of attention versus this other blah blah blah. I don't know if you want if you want to do that, you can do that. They just say give us five games. And then neat. Yeah, top vote getters. Maybe yeah. I'll go vote. <laughs> I know. Yes. We'll, we'll we'll put the we'll put the link to uh, the voting in our no, notes below. Uh, yeah, they, and they have some prizes that they will do from people who vote, and then you have to confirm your vote by email. And people who do that are then entered into um, a contest to win games or entry into the Spiel game convention. Cool. Because the same company that runs Spiel handles the DSP awards. Well, then I uh, definitely want to vote. Yes, free games. <laughs> Uh, also, Asmini Entertainment has announced a new fiction publishing brand called Aconite, which you're like, really? Really? You need to do this? It seems a little <laughs> odd. But Asmini Entertainment is the division within the larger Asmini company that's sort of responsible for publicizing and marketing the brands within its catalog. And so Aconite is part of that, where they talk about releasing fiction based on your favorite game worlds. And they just sort of leave it at that because they're soliciting material from various writers and they will begin publication in mid 2020 with a goal of releasing something monthly without specifying what that is or how it'll be available or, or what it is. So if you have ever wanted to do some Splendor fanfic, <laughs> yeah, maybe you can submit an entry or now's the time <laughs> yeah i don't know what else you want to do it's splendor fanfic <laughs> uh i mean there's already been a number of Catan novels fantasy flight games has published novels for uh its worlds that it does so what else you want to do some sort of uh ticket to ride murder mystery i mean Ooh. agatha agatha christie has already you know she's done that She's done oh, okay. that already with the murder on the train. Uh, I'm not sure what else you would want to do, but they just sort of leave it open. Something handled by Asmodee. Uh, we're looking at submissions. And so we'll see where <laughs> things go from there. Interesting. I wonder what brought that upon, you know, to do that, that they thought that that would be something that would be good. I, you know, if, if you're trying as well to license things for films, you're trying yeah. to license for television shows, you're trying to do everything. And of course, everything sort of cross markets and intersects one another and helps advertise everything around in a virtuous circle i mean i could see how it could be really good for like the days of wonder brand because all those like kids and families they could read a story about the games they're playing i mean i could see it well i i read the little arkham ones the novellas Ooh. <laughs> yeah so it could be more along those lines or a more organized effort rather than just within fantasy flight i have no idea so. cool yeah, just a mystery announcement for now. Um, looking ahead, uh, one game announcement I'll mention is by German publisher 2F Spiel, which is Freedom and Frieza. He has announced his big Spiel release, which is called Fast Sloths, or Faultier <laughs> in German. And this is a pick up and deliver game in which you are the thing being picked up because you are yes, a sloth. It's a fun game. You are a sloth, you don't want to move. You, but you still want to see things. You want to go around and visit all the trees and eat from eight of the nine trees that are in your landscape. But to do that, you want other animals to bring you there. Because we're, we're super lazy sloths. I don't know if we're lazy, <laughs> we're just slow. Yes, low energy sloths, as you'd say. <laughs> so each round, you're going to draft two or three animal cards, and they have to be different cards. You add them to your hand, and then you play as many cards of one animal as you want in order to use that animal to move you around the map. So if you're next to an animal, then you can sort of hop on its back, or they pull you on its back, depending on how lazy you want to think of yourself. Uh, if you <laughs> go on the eagle, it'll just move you in six spaces, within six spaces anywhere. Or the donkey will only go on certain landscapes, or the alligator will only take you across water or on the banks of, of the water. I like the elephant. The elephant, <laughs> yeah, the elephant tosses you with its trunk, so it'll carry you for a little while and then <laughs> throw you away. So there's 12 animals in the game. There's two double-sided landscape boards, so there's four orientations for the board. So you have lots of variability in that. 
and they give you a suggested starting setup for your first game, use these animals and these boards and place everything here. And then for your second game on, they say, you know, you can choose animals or pick them at random. And then you do a placement where players take turns putting animal tokens on the board. So then you can sort of have draft a strategy. I want to do this first and do this first. And, you know, however you want to work that, you can then place animals on the board and do that. So it's kind of neat because it's luck free and yet it's still kind of light. It's a great game. I actually made a great setup for Nikki, I think, to win that game where I set up a bunch of ants and then she basically got to use that same ant trail to go back. Yeah, it seems like you got to destroy the ant trail. Somehow. I don't know. What, how would you spend that to do that? I well, don't know. If you have enough movement points, then you can. So the ants are sort of a chain where if you have ants here, it can pick you up and then toss you over and toss you over and toss you over. If you have enough movement points at the end, then you can break the chain. So then someone else can't use it. But yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like the uh, pulling up the door as you go into the castle cool. behind you. Also, we always have our BGG show at BoardGameGeek.com email open for letters and notes and any kind of things you want to write us. We appreciate it. We also appreciate your likes and your subscribing to our channel and your clicking the notification bell to receive any notifications when we have new videos going up. Um, I want to thank my hosts, Steph Hodge and W. Eric Martin. Yay, thank you. We'll see you guys again in two weeks. So yeah. take care and have a great one. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys.